The Amped EV Podcast is sponsored by Autel Energy. Visit autelenergy.com for more information. Hello and welcome back to the Amped EV Podcast. My name is David. I am the editor for The Buzz. And I'm Nadine Vita. I'm the multimedia senior editor of Shop Owner. Nadine, welcome back. David, I'm amped to be here. I had to do it. (laughs) I am also amped. I'm amped every day. Yes. We have a really fun one today, I believe. I'm excited. Thanks for having me. Oh my gosh, of course. Please, just just like interrupt anything we're doing. <laughs> I'd be happy to. No, please. You're, I'm honored to have you on Thank you. anytime. Maybe truly. you guys will be seeing me as a featured guest in the AMP podcast in 2023. I, I think you might need to have a more established yeah. role here. The people want Nadine. Nice. Thanks. So uh, today, um, you know, looking forward, we're always trying to figure out, okay, where's this EV thing heading right right i mean like it yeah, can be we overwhelming have, it's it's extremely overwhelming there's so much to think about right and i feel like we're all kind of on the same page as far as like okay evs are getting a little more popular people are talking about them people want to know about them that's why we're here right. but you know looking forward looking into 2030 2040 2045 like where is this thing heading you know right. and um we have this huge, gigantic study put together by the ACA, the Auto Care Association, and MEMA Aftermarket Suppliers. They kind of teamed up and helped to put on this study, and they helped to tell us what this study means. We're going to hear from them today. Let's do it. I'm ready to dive into this topic and learn more. Awesome. So our guests today are Mike Chung, the Director of Market Intelligence for the Auto Care Association, and Philip Atkins, the Director of Strategic Research and Planning for MEMA Aftermarket Suppliers. Let's get right to it. Mike and Philip, thank you both so much for joining us today on the show. I really appreciate your time to help us dive into a study of this magnitude. Um, you know, it, there's just so much here, and I really want to hear from you as far as how do you approach, uh, you know, a subject like this. Um, you know, how where do you begin? Well, David, this is a huge um, initiative for both Mike and and myself, I think one of the key aspects was we wanted a study that had a a, um, reach far enough out in the future that would make it unique and be more helpful to our members. So one of the the criteria for for the study became well, let's look out to the year 2045. And as far as I know, that's that's pretty unique among the reports that deal with the electric vehicle market. Mike, do you have anything to add? No. There? Yeah, I'll, I'll be happy to add. Um, so Auto Care Association and AASA, MEMA, we've collaborated on a couple of different uh, projects that are beneficial to the entire industry in the sense of particularly coming up with a singular number to size the industry. One of those is our joint channel forecast model where we say this is how large our industry is. And as our executive leadership was thinking about what other trends are happening that we should be reporting on so that we have a singular voice. Electrification and adoption of of EVs um, was one of them. Mm -hmm. So Philip and I identified which organizations can we work with um, as external consultants that we have a, a strong working relationship with that we can get verifiable, trustworthy data from. So that's part of the process as well, because um, I know that Philip has worked with our provider strategy and on mm. this uh, for this particular study that they have a longstanding relationship. So there is some history there. So certainly a tip of the hat to our external provider strategy and for the uh, forecasting that they did here. Oh, excellent, excellent. So there's there's so much to go through here. Uh, it's it's hard to condense it in, into one show, but I'm gonna do my best here. One particularly interesting note that I uh, that caught my eye within the study was uh, regarding hybrids. So uh, you know the forecast notes that hybrid vehicles, both HEVs and PHEVs, will constitute less than five percent of the future U.S. car park. 
um, you know, even in the long run. So why do you believe that the love for hybrids isn't going to really have a solid hold in the States? Mike, I'll start with you. Sure. Um, a couple of things come to mind. One is what's really getting the headlines. Certainly we've seen Toyota Prius, we've seen other hybrids make a mark into the market, but I'm not sure if I'm allowed to say it this way, but is it quite as sexy as EVs, mm. right? We see EVs getting the headlines from both a policy standpoint, as well as a manufacturer standpoint. Mm. Manufacturers committing to um, turning their fleets into 100% EV by such and such a time frame, And I think that's balanced with um, policy goals at the state and federal level to make pronouncements such as we are going to have X percent of new vehicles by such and such date be um, BEV or basically zero emission vehicles. So mm -hmm. I think there is that that those kind of go hand in hand with one another when you have a policy pronouncement along with a manufacturer commitment and those help buoy each other to go up. Whereas for the hybrids, we haven't really seen that type of um, emphasis. Mm -hmm. And I think if we look at the consumer, uh, consumers, we, we, I feel like we can put a persona around the, the hybrid vehicle buyers. And for whatever reason, it just hasn't accelerated with regard to adoption as much as it has. And so EVs have been able to kind of take hold of that and then uh, press on the gas a little bit harder. That makes a lot of sense. Philip, do you have anything to add? Yeah, uh, to, to Mike's point, we are expecting upwards of 100 new EV models by between now and the year 2026, which gives the consumer a wide array of options to choose from when they're looking at uh, a new vehicle. Mm -hmm. You're not going to see that kind of commitment from the OEMs around hybrids. Also, David, I think that what's important is the fact that the e the hybrids will still have that internal combustion engine, the ICE, mm -hmm. and the power pr powertrain that goes with it and all the parts associated with that, which means all the repairs and maintenance that go with those ICE-associated parts and uh, parts. So that's just an extra cost that the, that the hybrids bear that the EVs won't. And that's what the OEMs are promising for the EVs, just a total, a, a, a lower cost of repair and maintenance for, for the BEVs. Got it. You both point out some awesome points. You project that the parts market through 2045 will see an increase in price since EVs have fewer mechanical parts prone to failure when compared to ICE vehicles. How will this shift to having to carry generally more expensive parts affect automotive repair shops across the country? Mike, we can start with you. Sure, and a really interesting question. And I think it's, um, it, it's an interesting question because as you point out, Nadine, EVs tend to have fewer parts um, that need to be replaced, fewer um, regular service items, uh, whether it's um, failure because of a mechanical issue or just wear and tear that needs to be replaced, like an oil change, a brake pad, and so forth. Right. And I think what's interesting here is that it can be really become an inventory and a supply chain management challenge for repair shops as well as retail stores, because with these, with the increased adoption, increasing adoption of EVs, if you are an auto parts uh, retailer, if you are a service provider, how are you managing? another set of parts potentially mm -hmm. as EVs continue to become more common. So there's that aspect. And I think whether it's a more expensive part or a less expensive part, I feel like um, each part could be its own case study with regard to how competitive it might be to be a parts provider for something that is less expensive or perhaps mm -hmm. more expensive and more complex. So I feel like um, there could be a lot of variations on a theme with regard to how competitive it could be, how many parts providers there will be, and as a, say, a service shop provider, how are you managing those relationships with the distributors, the parts manufacturers, and then forecasting the demand so that you can have the right level of inventory in your shops? Mm. Right. 
Philip, did you have anything you'd like to add? Yeah, I would say when you look at the value chain, the supplier, the distributor, the retailer, and then the repair shop, among all of them, the repair shop is least affected by whatever the cost of the part is. It's really the the distributors and the, re, the retailers that carry the inventory. All the repair shop does is one day they place an order for a part to the distributor, to the retailer. They receive the part, they put it in the vehicle, turn around and sell it to the, the vehicle owner as part of the overall cost of repair. So they don't really carry that much inventory. Mm -hmm. and, and to that degree, um, there's not that much uh, of an effect on the, on the repair shop. Got it. Got it. Uh, so I want to get into uh, s some of the global outlook here that uh, your forecast looks into. Philip, the forecast describes China as being the global EV leader as of today. So is there anything that we can kind of glean from the progress that China has made uh, here in the U.S. that, you know, might make the transition to EVs a little simpler or a little easier? Anything that we can learn there? Hmm. Yeah, that's a good question. And here I'll point to our uh, the, the studies that Mike and I produced along with Strategy and because we do have a section that uh, talks about what's going on in China. And it makes a couple of points. One is how China has addressed the high cost of batteries. And th they've done something pretty novel. They, some of the OEMs have separated the cost of the battery from the actual cost of the vehicle, which really reduces the sticker price for the vehicle. Now, of course, you still need a battery uh, and you can buy one outright or you can enter into a subscription uh, model so that every month or whatever time period you pay for the battery. And this is something that mm. we've seen a Vietnamese company adopt called VinFast. And they're coming here to my home state, North Carolina, and they have this subscription model for their batteries. And you pay that monthly cost and then they take on the full uh, cost of repair, maintenance and ultimately replacement for that uh, battery for the life of the car. So that's pretty novel and that, that originated mm -hmm. in China. Did Very that make sense? No, that, that, that makes a lot of sense. Do you see that being a strictly automotive uh, kind of design, a uh, uh, consumer automotive, or do you see that maybe being able to work for fleets, maybe medium duty as well? Well, I think the fleets will, will love that model. Yes, uh, because there's the they're passing on the cost of the replacement and repair, which will be a big part of the overall fleet cost. Don't you think, Mike? Oh, I agree. It reduces a little bit of that variability with regard to your um, operating expenses, certainly. Excellent. And Mike, do you have anything else that you'd like to uh, add as far as what we can possibly learn from China here in the U.S.? Sure, and certainly China and the U.S., they have their uh, distinctions as marketplaces and large ones at that, of course. And um, kind of along the lines of what Philip highlighted, um, another one of our uh, uh, study partners, YCP Solidiums, they've done some really interesting case studies on several uh, companies in China that have really changed their business model. And I think it can be interesting from the US point of view, because in the United States, we certainly have a very well-established framework, a lot of um, well-known companies from the parts manufacturers to the distributors, to the service providers, to the OEMs and so on and so forth. And it's an opportunity perhaps to look at what has been done in China. And I'm thinking about companies like Tuhu, which is T-U-H-U and this um, kind of what they call a self-operated O2O online to offline business mode, where you think about your users, who those uh, individuals like any of us who may be purchasing a car and corresponding parts, are they going in person? Or are they um, executing their purchases online? And so mm -hmm. if you have an e-commerce platform, how does that connect to your warehousing, your logistics systems? How do those um, that how does that data, how does that order information get communicated to an online store, an offline store, 
to the manufacturers as part of that mm. feedback loop for parts demand. And another thing I'll point out along those lines is kind of that after sales system. So you have your supply chain system, your online service, your warehouse and logistics systems, your offline and your uh, service system and your after sales system. How does each stakeholder interact within those systems from a uh, purchasing standpoint and from a data sharing standpoint? So are there opportunities where new entrants can come in and quote unquote disrupt um, the, a model, mm. particularly as we have um, new vehicles, uh, perhaps as, as, uh, as Philip mentioned, new ways to purchase or take responsibility for particular parts. So it's a real opportunity for innovation and certainly um, a lot can be learned from what's happening in China. Interesting. Yeah, I, I think you're right. As far as innovation goes, we're already seeing these you know, new players in the EV space come up and they're kind of disrupting even the way that you sell cars. You know, more, we're seeing more of a selling these EVs online kind of model rather than you know, going to your local dealer to, to get these. So I think you're right. There's probably a lot of innovation to be had and in, you know, the parts and suppliers uh, arena as well. David, yeah, also, that's a great um, point. go ahead, Mike. Oh, sure. So I, I think kind of piggybacking off of that is sometimes Philip and I will talk about things like what's the uh, the dealer of the future look like? And we've seen some headlines about that with regard to particularly with all the supply chain and inventory challenges that dealers have had. All of that real estate, the service mm -hmm. movement towards EV, there's a lot. I think it'll be uh, very interesting to go a couple of decades into the future and see you know, where we will be. But yeah, Philip, back to you. Yeah, just to add to that point, which I think is an interesting one, certainly the dealer model must embrace and enhance the um, revenue they get from the service side of things. And EV vehicles give them that chance because right now the uh, EV owner is being trained to go back to the dealer for service. And, um, but I like what Tuhu, Mike mentioned Tuhu in China. Mm -hmm. I like what they're doing that kind of defends the independent aftermarkets share. Tuhu has, is setting up a chain, a series of uh, brick and mortar facilities that focus just on EV. And that's gotta be mm -hmm. pretty reassuring to the Chinese vehicle owner that, okay, if they're, if I take it to this repair shop that is just EV oriented, they must be pretty well trained. They must have all the technology they need to to make these repairs. So I think that's a good good way of uh, defending the independent aftermarket's share of EV maintenance. Great point. Excellent points. So Mike, I'll start with you. Both small aftermarket service shops with about one to three bays and larger ones with four or more bays are beginning to make EV investments at about 40% but your research shows only around 15% of the smaller shops are actively advertising they have hybrid EV serviceability. Um, where that jumps to about 45% in the mid to large shops, why do you think that is? Yeah, really good question. And a couple of things come to mind. Uh, certainly, one thing I think about is working capital. How much, how, how much do you have in the way of assets to make the investment to service, diagnose, and repair EVs because the uh, infrastructure costs are not insignificant, certainly. And I'd mm -hmm. just like to think that a larger, larger shops, which perhaps may be part of a, a, a larger franchise or regional or national uh, network, would likely have more investment capability to uh, make the foray into EVs. Um, another thing that comes to mind, Nadine, is regional effects. As we see California, um, some of the warmer weather states. Now, granted, there are some colder weather states that have higher EV adoption rates. Sure. But I think about if I'm a shop owner, what am I seeing day to day? Who are my clientele? Do, do I see EVs in my service mix? Or am I perhaps um, catering to a crowd that is more... I, ICE vehicles of a certain age, certain makes. So those things come to mind. 
as well as just the normal day-to-day -day business, busyness rather. So if I'm an owner of a smaller shop, I may be just very busy taking care of my vehicles and then being able to make that investment and then advertise it could be, you know, I'm not quite there yet. So those are some of the things that come to my mind. Okay. Philip, was there something that you'd like to add? Well, Nadine, I think Mike is, has hit the nail on the head with the um, total park that is share of vehicles on the road for um, the hybrids and the EVs and the, the BEVs at 2% right now. That means 98% of the vehicles on the road are the internal combustion engine variety. If I'm a small shop owner, just as Mike said, I'm probably going to make the decision to focus my, if I do any advertising at all, and I probably don't at that small, of a, if I'm that small of a shop, but if I do any advertising, it'd probably be toward the internal combustion engine. Mm -hmm. But it does, it does raise a question, and it's a good one, Nadine, of uh, eventually the independent aftermarket has got to come to grips with this issue because if they are not a, if they are not servicing the BEVs right now, that means the dealers are. And again, as I mentioned before, mm. all the BEV owners are being kind of trained to go back to the dealer. And that's just something that the independent aftermarket is going to need to come to grips with. Mm. That's a really interesting point. And, you know, kind, kind of with that, uh, you, you had a lot of research that you did uh, as far as uh, specific components or, um, you know, types of components that uh, you, you forecasted going into 2045 as far as replacement rates with those kinds of things. And one of the ones that caught my eye was electrical component replacement rates. Um, you know, through 2045, you have that some components are seeing a large increase there where others are actually decreasing. And so I wanted to kind of ask you, Philip, where, where is that coming from? How are you, how are you gauging that, especially with um, you know, EVs uh, becoming more popular? You would, you would almost think that it would just all go up. Oh, well, that's a curve. I honestly thought that our replacement rates would go up or at least stay the same if they're the true BEV area unless you're looking at some components that are associated more with the ICE technology. Hmm. Um, when I think about the replacement rates, and it's been a while since I've looked at them, they went out through 2030, 2035, and the, the share of park for BEVs and EVs didn't change much between now and 2030. So the replacement rates really, whether ICE or BEV, shouldn't change that much either, but um, I guess I'm stumped a little bit on that right now. Mike, can you help me out at all? Yeah, it, it's a, I, I'm seeing a couple of different things here. And um, Philip, I think you're right with regard to the replacement rates. They are um, staying pretty steady. One thing I was thinking about, David, is also just the growth of the parts um, by mm -hmm. category. And certainly electric is, a, has strong growth. Now, um, EVs, higher adoption as we go forward, it makes sense that those part categories would um, be strong performers into the future. And I think ADOS was um, another strong performer. So I think as the, uh, the car park shifts towards EVs, then we'll certainly have more vehicles and ergo more parts to supply those vehicles. And then part of the maintenance that goes along with it. And I think that gets to your replacement rate um, aspect um, so certainly electric electric parts, and then um, the uh, the ADOS as we see more vehicle technologies, the proliferation of newer technologies, and as they get adopted into both ICE and EVs, that's mm -hmm. certainly an area for growth. Got it. Got it. No, that David, that makes complete sense. I have one thing to add as I'm thinking through your question. Right now, of course, uh, the EV category is new. That means the parts are new. And with any new technology, the failure rate of components is going to be higher now mm -hmm. than in the future. And so that could be an explanation for how we've modeled, how Strategy Ant has modeled the replacement rates in their report. That makes a lot of sense too. 
Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, great points. Well, hey, thank you both for taking the time today. Uh, there's there's so much that we could get into here. I'd love to talk to you again, maybe down the road, but um, sure. just really appreciate your insight here because uh, I know I learned a lot. Definitely, same as me. Well, well, great talking to you about it. to be part of this conversation and would look, look forward to continuing it in the, in the months to come. So thank you for having me and thanks for having us. <laughs> Whew. Wow. <laughs> okay, that's a lot to break down. <laughs> that was a lot to take in, but that was very interesting to hear about. And honestly, we could be here for another two and a half hours. If we oh, yeah. To. I we, mean, this we, study is substantial. Definitely. There is a lot to it. But, I mean, they really... One thing, I've got a hot take for you. China, right? Yeah. I mean, you know, you never really know what they're doing over there. Right. You know, it's a little mysterious and right. everything. But they have some really good points when it comes to how China is approaching EVs and what the U.S. could possibly right. do to kind of learn from them. One right. of them being that model where you kind of separate the vehicle itself from the battery. And right. you can just kind of have this model where, okay, I'm going to take the vehicle, I'm going to purchase the vehicle, but then I'm going to like lease the right. battery. That's oh really interesting. That's a really interesting thought. And uh, as Philip was saying, like fleets especially, this could be a very, very right. uh, lucrative model right. for them where they don't have to worry about you know, these batteries getting old or what they're going to do when they need to all of a sudden recycle hundreds of batteries right. being in their fleet. That was that was really interesting. Something else that I thought was really interesting, too, was the fact that they were saying by 2045, there might not even be hybrids on the road. Yeah, yeah. Hardly any. Hardly any at all. And I, it, it makes sense when you think about it. I mean, these manufacturers are saying, hey, we're going to only produce battery electric vehicles by X date. Right. Fleets are doing the same thing. They're saying, hey, we're going to integrate all these battery electric vehicles by X date. Right. And if this is happening with everybody, where do the hybrids go? So, David, I see you pulling into work every day. Are we behind with our gas cars? We're, we're very behind. Oh, yeah, my goodness. Yeah. Well, I, I truly don't know. I mean, <laughs> right now the car park is 2%, right? Right. 2% uh, EVs. So, you know, are we behind? Actually, maybe not. I don't know if we want to be an early adopter or not. But right, I mean, right. that is a good point when you start projecting out that far. And, Definitely. You know, we're going to start seeing things closer to... And you know, I mean, if you really think about it, it's already 2023. It's going to be here before we know it. You're yes. right. 2023 is going to be a whole new year for EVs, just like 2024 and probably 2025 and beyond. And right. I think it's good to have these kind of forecasts to see, okay, where are things headed? Definitely. I learned a lot. There's a lot more to learn. I hope we can get these guys back on the podcast I hope again so in too. the future because Definitely. this was really interesting. Yes, yeah, seriously. Thanks again for having me, David. I always love these conversations and learning more about the EV side of things. Nadine, I am amped. Amped. <laughs> Thanks for joining us today. We'll catch you next time. See ya.